on soft power, India and Gulf education and cultural ties. The chairperson for this session is Ambassador Talmi Zahmed. And so I'm very happy to introduce you uh, to those who have not been here yesterday. Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1974. Early in his career, he was posted in a number of West Asian countries like Kuwait, Iraq, and Yemen. He has served as India's ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UAE. He's the honorary advisor to FIKI for Gulf region and an independent consultant based in Dubai. He writes and lectures frequently on political Islam, the politics of West Asia and energy security issues. Sir, I would like you to conduct the session. Thank you. I understand, I understand that uh, Dr. Vidya would like to address the audience at the outset. So welcome, madam. Uh, no, I'll just take two minutes. I think it's a very important session. Uh, and uh, it just reminded me of um, what culture has uh, played a role or what soft power has played a role in my life and uh, the life of my family. And uh, I just thought in about a minute I would like to narrate that. Uh, so um, when we were young doctors practicing here in, in India, um, my husband wanted to do his higher studies. And uh, because he wanted to do his higher studies uh, with the British qualifying examination, naturally Indian doctors who are struggling do not have that kind of money to go to UK and give the exam and so on. So we used to look at all these advertisements that would come in uh, the so-called gray pages of Times of India then. And uh, we saw an advertisement from the Ministry of Health, Sultanate of Oman, uh, inviting uh, doctors to join uh, the Ministry of Health. And without informing me, my husband applied and uh, we were called for the interview, both of us. And we went for the interview uh, to Mumbai and um, both of us being gynecologists, obviously I got selected because Sultanate of Oman uh, did not allow male gynecologists to practice there. Uh, nevertheless, uh, when I got selected, it was quite a surprise. And uh, in fact, I was happy because I thought that I can then say that I don't want to go and Rajiv was not anyway selected. But then he somehow convinced his people there and said that I don't mind doing surgery, medicine, pediatrics. I'm excellent at anything in medicine and you can take me. And surprisingly, he could manage to convince them and then he was selected as a doctor to actually do pediatrics and then medicine and not obs gynae. And therefore, both of us left for Oman. I was extremely reluctant because I thought I'm a, I'm a true patriot and if I have studied here, I should practice here and give my best to the people in India. And why am I going to this country, which we didn't even know where Oman was. Uh, we just knew it was a part of the Gulf. When we went there, in fact, some of my friends even uh, jokingly said, you know, you're going to go to a place where there will be camels. So you're probably your two little kids would be drinking camel's milk instead of cow's milk or buffalo's milk. And there will be sand around and you'll just be lost. Um, we, when we went there, it was a surprise to see a country or a city like Muscat so well developed with excellent roads, excellent development. People were so warm and um, what I thought was uh, and what I feared of just turned out to be a wonderful experience. So much so that uh, I learned Arabic just because uh, I was placed in a place which was not Muscat where people spoke English, but I was, we were placed in a place called Al Suwaik, which is about an hour on the seaside. We had a beautiful bungalow given by the Ministry of Health Oman. And um, you know, I, I of course practiced obs gynae and therefore I was in touch with ladies, women, and my husband would see small kids. So much so that whenever my parents, my parents means my father never traveled to Muscat when we were there, but my mother used to come for every vacation and my sister Swati would come. And the people were so warm that there were these, uh, because it was a small town, so people came with, you know, uh, big buckets of dates to welcome my mother and my sister. And so, and that's the affection that they showed. Uh, so much so that they would even discuss about their husbands with me and with many of us as lady doctors and several things that happened in their families. I think uh, my children grew up and felt that that was their home. In fact, when we came back, I took a, it took a long time for both me and Rajiv to convince that India is their home and that's not their home. And let me tell you that these kind of experiences that you get in a foreign country, especially in the Gulf region and in a country like Oman, I think transformed our lives both as people, as citizens, as uh, even financially, because they gave us so much that we jumped the ladder up much more than what our struggling doctor friends did in India. But I think beyond that was the warmth of that country, 
and uh, you know, I can, I can just say this. After many, many years, of course, uh, Dr. Muzumdar was invited there by, uh, uh, by the Indian community for some function. And as many of you all must be knowing, sir doesn't like to travel abroad. And uh, so uh, very reluctantly though, he did uh, say that, okay, let me accept this invitation. And when we went there, uh, he also said the same thing, that this is a country with great warmth from the people, not just the Indian people, but the Omani people. So I think the soft power or the power of culture plays a lot in our lives and I'm sure, uh, you know, it does play a lot in business and trade and investments as what Mr. Asim Srivastava just told you young students. So the point that I'm trying to drive home to all the students here is that Symbiosis provides you an opportunity with young men and women from different parts of the world. People like Simon and uh, Kinley and several others from 85 different countries are here on the Symbiosis campus. Many of them may not be even studying in your classrooms, but I'm sure you see them at programs. Try and make friends with these young children because the warmth that you will give to them and the reciprocation that they will give to you will probably go a long way even in establishing business ties for some of you MBA students who would be interested in. So with these few words, sir, I would request you to begin this session and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. Uh, the term symbiosis itself is very inspirational because it means getting together a wide variety of different people. And now you have an address that when you go abroad, you will again be with different people and obviously you will have a symbiotic relationship with them because you have been nurtured here. Now, after, as far as these two days are concerned, they are focused on the situation in the Gulf region and the shape of India's ties as they prevail at present and what we can do about them for the future. The discourse so far has been political and commercial. These are considered the hard subjects. And now we are venturing at the end of the two-day event into what is called the soft area. The soft area of education, culture, and I'm going to add media as well. But this is, I mean, this concept of soft power, which was invented recently by some American scholars, it has to be remembered that it is not a standalone concept. It is an adjunct to power. So it actually supplements and very often complements the exercise of power and influence that a state can bring on to another, but with the ameliorating effect of various other cultural themes that bring people together based on, based on a large degree of historical comfort as well as certain instrumentalities that we can use in contemporary times mainly through the agency of education, as is taking place here, and also through the media. Now, we have a panel that is extremely well equipped to, uh, to have an address on this subject. My first speaker will be Mr. Dino Varki. He is based in Dubai, my city. He is the third generation Varki associated with education in the Gulf. There is a beautiful story about his parents who used to teach English to the Emiratis under trees. And the royal family has not forgotten this gift that they bestowed upon their children. And therefore, they are, they, they, they even today enjoy the deep affection of the royal family and of entire generations of Emiratis. Dino is a very worthy third generation Varki. His father is Mr. Sunny Varki, who has a series of educational institutions across the Gulf. They are known for their extremely high standards. And they have thousands of Indian children and foreign children studying there. They are also extremely well established in the United Kingdom, where they run top class public schools. So they compete with standard English public schools in that regard. Mr. Sunny Waki has been honored with, with the Padma Shri by the government of India at the time when I was posted in Abu Dhabi. Mr. Dino Waki. Good afternoon, Excellency. Thank you very much for that introduction. Actually, you've given such a good introduction that I don't actually have to say anything now. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, everyone.
to my fellow panelists, Dr. Vidya, your family, thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and thank you for allowing me to explore uh, the role that Indian private sector can play in enhancing education and cultural ties between the India and the GCC. By the way of introduction, although His Excellency did a wonderful job, my name is Dino Varki. I am the Group Executive Director of GEMS Education, which today is the world's largest K-12 education provider. My family is Indian. I'm proud to say that I still hold my Indian passport. And I hope that my story or the story of my family will serve uh, as an appropriate starting point. Uh, an appropriate starting point in order to illustrate the potential that surrounds our theme. Uh, I must add that uh, much of my perspective today will be focused on the United Arab Emirates um, and its relationship with India. Uh, whilst there are similarities and there are common trends uh, across the nations in the GCC, it would be far too simplistic, uh, and I must say, slightly naive to say, to think that, sorry, excuse me, uh, and dare I say naive, uh, to make the assumption that countries within the region are driven by the same imperatives or that they exist within the same context. So, back to our story. Uh, during the late 1950s, uh, the late great Sheikh Rashid, the first ruler of Dubai, was alleged to have said, I need someone to teach my people how to speak English. Someone within his court put up his hand and said, I know someone. That someone happened to be my grandfather. So in 1959, my grandparents emigrated from the south of India to Dubai. We were from a lower middle class family. Educated, certainly. But as you can imagine, there was very little opportunity for us at home. So they chose to leave everything that they knew and make the courageous journey in order to make a better life for themselves and their family. So they started in the UAE, initially by tutoring adults. Simple, basic literacy and numeracy. And the families that they taught represented the two most dominant communities, Emiratis, or the local population, as well as the South Asians. Then, as is the case today, the people of the UAE have always had a deep-founded, deep-rooted respect for the education system in India. And this is certainly a point that I would like to come back to because it represents the underlying foundation for accelerating the educational and cultural ties between these two nations. So, in 1968, my grandparents were able to start their very first school. And this in itself was a huge achievement because they were teachers first, not necessarily commercial or business-minded. Our first school grew to 300 students over the course of the next 12 years, at which point my father saw the opportunity not only to fulfill a social imperative, but a commercial imperative as well. He believed that we could do so much more. Why? Because we believe that education is the most important challenge and as a result, the most important opportunity that lies before all of us the opportunity to resolve the world's most pressing problems. Consequently, for all of our history, we've been driven by a very simple and singular purpose, to try and put a quality education within the reach of every child in every community that we serve. Today, that purpose has brought us to a point where we have the privilege of educating over 250,000 children each and every day that represent over 170 different nationalities. Imagine, from India to the UAE to being the largest in the world. If nothing else, our story should demonstrate that by creating a value proposition that is able to leverage the advantages of both, the India and the UAE, it is possible to create something that will be dominant and resilient globally. And I have to emphasize that our story is not unique. Across diverse sectors, you can see that this underlying value chain has been replicated. So the natural question at this point is, does that opportunity still exist 
It existed 56 years ago. Does it still exist today? So today, the public and private education market in the GCC is estimated to be valued at over 60 billion US dollars. And this is compared to only 36 in 2010. If I look at the UAE specifically, which is still, for GEMS, our largest and fastest growing education market globally, private school enrollment in K-12 has been accelerating in terms of growth year on year. 7.1%, 8.7%, and over 10% this past year. Going forward, the projections suggest that every year, close to 300,000 students will need education provision within the GCC until 2020. It is clear that in the face of such demand, we will need increasing private sector participation to bridge the gap. However, what is driving this demand? There is, of course, a natural demographic advantage. As a percentage of the overall population, the GCC has the largest and fastest growing youth population in the world. And this is, of course, brought into sharp focus the underlying adverse consequences of having education systems that are not able to produce young people capable of contributing to society positively through gainful employment. The alternative is what we're witnessing today, the escalating war against extremism and terrorist action. Therefore, post-Arab Spring, governments across the GCC have been galvanized to improve their education system. We see this manifested in the significant increase in public expenditure on education across secondary, tertiary, and the vocational space. The most significant example of this would, of course, be Saudi Arabia, which has prioritized over 25% of their national budget towards education. The countries within the GCC are also acutely aware that they need to diversify their economies. Oil and gas are diminishing resource. So how do they sustain their future? Dubai and the UAE uh, are certainly the exemplar when it comes to this regard, where in the UAE today, 71% of GDP comes from non-oil revenues. In fact, in Dubai, less than 2% of their GDP is derived from oil revenues. It is certainly a remarkable story, but it also highlights a clear and present need. I've seen references elsewhere within the, conversation, uh, within the conference regarding some concerns associated with the nationalization policies within GCC nations. The reality is that in order to drive the diversification agenda, GCC nations will continue to be reliant on importing human capital and intellectual property from other parts of the world. The benefits of this are twofold. Naturally, inward mobility of expatriates drives greater demand for private schools. Uh, for context, public schools within the GCC cater only to the local national population. In a place like, Indi uh, in a place like the UAE, where over 80% of the population are expatriates, private education provision becomes the natural choice. Given that the single largest majority within this group is from India, then there would be a clear opportunity for Indian private education providers, whether in K-12 or higher education, to take advantage of this macro trend. The secondary benefit and opportunity extends to Indian companies across other sectors. It's important to understand on a country-by-country -country basis where nations within the GCC wish to drive their economies and present that value proposition back to them that meets the need. Again, if I may use UA as an example, today I understand that over 17.5% of total imports comes from India. However, the UA has set the target of becoming amongst the most innovative nations in the world by 2021. It is truly important to reflect how Indian private sector companies can support this innovation agenda. Unlocking this question 
will enable India to significantly add to the economic and intrinsic value of goods, services, and talent exported to the UAE. Again, imagine. A similar approach should be employed for other GCC nations, but it's really important to recognize that these nations are at a less mature stage in terms of their diversification journey. As others have said, today, as India accelerates economic reforms and improves its investment and business environment, and the UAE becomes increasingly advanced and a diversified economy, the two countries have the potential to build a transformative economic partnership, not only for the sustained prosperity of these two countries, but also to advance progress in the region. Hopefully our story highlights that the two nations also share a commitment to, to openness, peaceful coexistence and social harmony that are based on their cultural traditions, spiritual values and shared heritage. In these very, very uncertain times, the need to unlock the potential of this historic relationship is greater than ever before. And again, during our Q&A session afterwards, please feel free to ask me uh, questions around this theme. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dino. He has highlighted the central importance of education, training, and skill building in the GCC. Over the last two days, we've heard a lot about conflict and violence and confrontation, extremism, sectarianism. But this region also has other things happening at the same time. Focus on knowledge building, on becoming innovative, of having new kinds of management skills, of working harmoniously with foreign communities. Now that is another parallel narrative that is as important as far as the dynamics of this region is concerned. And therefore there are spaces and opportunities for Indian managers and Indian professionals to make a contribution in this regard, which will be a significant part of India's outreach to this region. To keep this, uh, in order to take this narrative forward, we turn to Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan. You have already met him before. He was the chairperson of the previous session. He brings together, of course, his great diplomatic experience, a very wide diplomatic experience across different parts of the world, but very rich multilateral experience. And now, post-retirement, he is central as far as the media is concerned in Kerala, as well as education in Kerala. And Kerala is terribly important because out of the 8 million people we have in the GCC countries, 4 million are from Kerala. So, sir, please. Thank you, Talmis, for uh, explaining my credentials to be here. And thank you, Symbiosis, for inviting me. I have one more credential which you did not mention. My baby brother is the Indian ambassador to UAE now. But I must say that whatever I say has nothing to be attributed to him. True, without the presentation of the Kerala angle, no discussion on the Gulf will be complete. Because no other state in India has been affected so much by the two-way interaction between the Gulf and India. The story goes that in 1973, if the Keralites had not gone to the Gulf, Kerala would have been sunk by now. There's no aspect of in Kerala life which has not been affected mostly positively and sometimes negatively because of this exodus to the Gulf. And in my new capacity as the one who coordinates higher education in Kerala, I've been to the Gulf several times in the recent past. And as we have seen from Mr. Varki's presentation, education is synonymous with India. And there is so much demand 
for Indian education there. But before I go to that, let me compliment Symbiosis for something else. Because after this conference was planned, and after I had agreed to come and speak, something dramatic happened in the India-GCC relations. That is Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the UAE. I was wondering how Symbiosis anticipated this. How did you have this foresight? Because if that had not happened, this conference would have been speculative. But today, it is celebratory. We are celebrating a change in India, GCC relations. So one can say the theme of what I'm going to say is this, that long cultural interaction, educational cooperation, and contacts between people can blossom into a political strategic partnership. You do not need any other evidence to show this. The title of the conference is, of course, Linking West. That itself tells the story of the times. Because we never thought West Asia is West. Yesterday we had some debate about whether it should be Middle East or West Asia. When we spoke of the West, we were talking about the West beyond West Asia. So it's not that we did not look West. The problem was we were looking West and West Asia was also looking West, so we missed each other. It is when West Asia started looking East that our eyes met and we found these immense uh, possibilities. But everything has its time and therefore what we see today is that the Indian diaspora in the Gulf and the cultural interaction have blossomed into a strategic partnership. The first aspect, of course, is the fact that skilled and unskilled people from India went to the Gulf. It was a mutually beneficial deal because GCC countries wanted somebody to get their deserts bloom and our people did that diligently. And the economy in India needed their remittances. And our people did not live in cocoons because they had the opportunity of expressing themselves, worshipping, and the number of cultural organizations that came up. And so the exposure that the GCC countries got has resulted in a kind of confidence building among our, among our people. Many Indian workers spoke Arabic before they went to the Gulf. And many people in the Gulf began speaking in Hindi and Malayalam because their parents had brought smattering of it during their voyages to the East. Indians invited their friends and their employers to come to the resorts in Kerala for Ayurvedic rejuvenation and to taste the fabulous food. So today we have a very close cultural relationship. When the seven Emirates that formed the UAE in 1971 have for long had close interaction with the west coast of India, with Bombay, Pune, Gujarat, Malabar being main points of interaction. Pearls, dates, and salted fish were exported to India. And almost all their needs from food items to textiles and furniture coming from India. Sheikh Syed's palace in Al Ain, now a museum, is full of Indian furniture and textiles. 
I hear that young men would offer the finest silks of India when seeking brides. Indian sword was a prized possession. Families were sent to Bombay for holiday and shopping when the menfolk were busy at sea during the pearl dry diving season. Mirage near Pune was a popular destination for medical treatment. Wood and coir to make boats and boats themselves came from the Malabar coast. And I can go on forever. Indian merchants dominated trade in the Gulf, while teachers, doctors, accountants, and professionals from India were pioneering service providers as lifestyle changed from that of wandering Bedouins to a settled urban living. With, with television came Bollywood, dubbed into Arabic with fans following every gossip in the life of actors on and off the screen. Urdu, Hindi, and Malayalam are spoken specially by those of the older generation. Cricket infrastructure has come up in Sharjah, Dubai, and even in Abu Dhabi to attract matches between the term teams of the subcontinent. Nothing attracts more people in these cities than an India-Pakistan cricket match. It was no accident that Prime Minister Narendra Modi chose to address the Indians in the cricket stadium in Dubai. Indian associations and community organizations flourish and compete with each other in bringing in every conceivable name of performers, starting from Pandit Resraj to Mamuti and Mohanlal of Malayalam cinema. So the Tourism and Cultural Authority is currently hosting the Indian Symphony Orchestra in Mum of Mumbai. Guls are rendering Rabindra Sangeet and a reputed Kathak group for a predominantly Emirati audience. Contemporary Indian artists are featured prominently in the art exhibitions. The Abu Dhabi branch of the Louvre has already acquired an antique Nadaraja statue from a museum in Australia, a large Indian miniature paintings collection that belonged to James Ivory of the Merchant Ivory fame. Onam is celebrated every weekend from August to November in some part of UAE with greater gusto than we would do back in Kerala. Indian newspapers are published in the Gulf, and Indians outnumber the local population in some, some countries, but their cultural milieu has not been affected by India's cultural influence. So it is from here that first the trade grew. GCC is the biggest trading partner of Indian, India today, and it provides half of India's oil requirements. So with all these ingredients, it was not surprising that when the right moment came, when the global power shifted from the west to the east, when the United States began disengaging from the region because of the rapidly reducing dependence on Gulf oil, the menace of terrorism and, terrorism and piracy demanded cooperation between India and the region, and, yes, and India's economic growth and keenness to seek investments impressed the Gulf community. And that is why Prime Minister Narendra Modi struck gold in the Gulf during his recent visit to the UAE. He received a warm welcome by the Crown Prince and his brothers at the Abu Dhabi airport, held cordial discussions with them, visited the Grand Mosque, met Indian workers in labor camp, received the gift of a plot of land for a Hindu temple in Abu Dhabi, and issued a historic joint statement with the Crown Prince. In Dubai, a 50,000 strong audience heard an electrifying speech about his accomplishments and future plans. Basking in the glory of a highly successful visit, Prime Minister Modi wondered why no Indian Prime Minister had visited the UAE for 34 years, even though there were 700 flights a week from India to the Gulf. He was implying that the government Governments were far behind the people in forging ties with the Gulf. Yesterday there was some discussion whether Pakistan was relevant in the India-Gulf relations. 
I shall not go into it because it's a political matter. But I would simply say that a dawn editorial remarked that the visit, that is Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit, should be nothing less than a wake-up call for Pakistan. Even more significantly, it said, lingering territorial disputes are no longer the driving force behind foreign policy. Instead, the foreign interests of states are, are now more than ever before viewed through an economic lens. I wish Pakistan had practiced what the dawn is preaching. Prime Minister Modi's Arab Odyssey was both a culmination of age-old ties and the beginning of a new era. The ease with which an Islamic country related to a person of Modi's background and reputation was striking. The UAE rulers seemed to care more about India's future than about Modi's past. The success of his visit to the UAE was an instance of brand India having greater appeal than brand Modi. I dwelt at length on the visit of our Prime Minister to show how the soft power of India played itself out in forging a strategic partnership in the Gulf. The cultural and educational cooperation will also grow in the, in the new dispensation. India already has cultural and educational exchange programs between the, the, the countries the, in the region. India is synonymous with education and a large number of Indian schools have multiplied educational opportunities. Indian universities of repute have campuses in the Gulf. Indian cultural centers attract not only the Indian community, but also the local population. The Gulf has discovered the vast technology and knowledge resources of India. Joint research projects have already been launched in several Gulf countries. India's experience of pluralism, despite its diversity and economic problems, should provide inspiration to the Gulf, which is struggling with sectarian divisions. Friends, India and the Gulf have rediscovered each other in the new global context. But what gives strength to the new partnership are the civilizational links and cultural affinities. Soft power is at work between India and the Gulf. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador. Ambassador Srinivasan has very skillfully woven the millennia-old civilizational ties that India has with this region and has centered around the visit of, of Prime Minister Modi shown how these and he has shown how these civilizational connectivities are still resonant and indeed a significant part of our uh, effort to play a role in this region so you can see the overlap between political economic and cultural aspects of our outreach here education is a very important factor in our cultural penetration of the region. We have here a distinguished educationist, Dr. Veena Bhalla. She has devoted her life to education and is presently a senior officer with the Association of Indian Universities. She will talk to us about how higher education can play a role in engaging India with the GCC. Thank you. International students. International students are dif uh, identified differently by different organizations. Like UNESCO defines them as students who cross borders for tertiary education of at least one academic year duration to undertake degree and diploma programs. Uh, International Institute of Education additionally includes students coming, from sh coming for short-term certificate courses and for study abroad program. The foreign registration office includes, as international students, all persons coming on student visa. And AAU criterion is the Association of Indian Universities in accordance list, uh, with definition given by UNESCO lists an international students 
uh, in its database only students who are registered in the universities and colleges for post higher secondary programs of at least one academic year. The Association of Indian Universities has been collecting information on international students in India since 1995 and the data has been periodically analyzed. In view of the fact uh, that it is difficult to get absolute numbers because of shortage of return, in the, uh, it is possible only to ascertain trends. A survey was conducted recently by AIU for the academic year 2013-14. It covers besides data on sources, source countries of international students uh, the level of education for which the international student is registered and his her broad discipline of study. And uh, this year actually I have included the data of uh, international students from distance education uh, uh, universities also like Indira Gandhi University because the Indira Gandhi Open University in New Delhi is the largest distance learning institution in the world. It has ambitious plans for providing cross-border education to students in West Asia and Africa. It has been started offering distance education programs to these regions. Uh, that's why I have included this. And for 2013-14, the number as recorded at the end of March 2015 is around 31,000 in 160 universities. Actually, we sent a performa to all the member universities and uh, member universities were 525 that time, but we received the response from 200 universities and uh, students were there, international students were there in 160 universities and 40 universities we received nil information. And uh, the number could possibly go up to about 34,000 when returns are filed by all important universities. Much better growth had been anticipated, but this has not taken place. Out of 160 universities, 61 universities have students from West Asian countries, and 65% have come for undergraduate education about 30% for postgraduate studies and 6% for research. Gulf countries accounts for 17% and the rest are from other parts of the world. Students for, uh, from Gulf countries in India. Number one is Iraq uh, and we have 1194 11, uh, students from Iraq. Number two is Iran. Uh, uh, one, 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 one students are there in, uh, from Iran in India. And number three is Saudi Arabia, 912. Number four is Oman, 711. Number five is Kuwait, 481. And U UAE, 393. And Bahrain, 352. And eighth is Qatar, 99 students. And total we have uh, 1,253, and this is very clear from this uh, figure also, how many students uh, we have from Gulf countries. About 40% of international students from Gulf countries are female, which in itself is encouraging. The choice of disciplines is also varied. About 30% of the students are in the liberal art, arts, social sciences, science and commerce. And the rest are enrolled for professional programs. And eight universities have more than 100 students. Of these, four are private universities. There has been a fall in number of students in the case of some leading public universities. While the distance education mode is useful, this kind of education without crossing national border does not bring in the true spirit of international education. One of the principal objectives of which should, no, uh, should be provided cross-border cultural experiences. Most importantly, in the 21st century, there have been two innovative developments. They may well change the way 
we learn. These are the setting up of open education resources and the launch of massive open online courses. The IGNU has ambitious plans for providing cross-border distance education to students in West Asia, as I said earlier. And more than 100 students uh, out of 61 uh, country, uh, universities, we have data from 61 universities. Uh, and uh, out of 61, we have eight universities only, which have more than 100 students. IGNU has the maximum number of students. 1,695, and second one is Symbiosis International University, 8,065. <laughs> and had we not included the debt of IGNU, Symbiosis was number one that time. And third uh, is Pune University, OP Jindal University is fourth. Uh, this Sam Higginbottom uh, Institute of Agriculture, uh, Technology and Science, 260, Bharti Vidyapit, 232, University of Mysore, 177, NIT Varangal, uh, 111. And three universities are from Pune. The interest of the public universities in international student mobility seems to be waning. It is probably because of lack of resources in terms of infrastructure and human resources and finance, or because there is difficulty in finding teachers willing to undertake the onerous responsibilities of foreign student advisor. Self-financing, private uh, universities have more students. They are seeking to internationalize operations, possibly because international students are a source of revenue and uh, add to prestige. They are positioning themselves in the market through uh, advertisement, developing a brand of other, uh, of other uh, means. The international student community is growing very fast globally, but not in India. Keeping in view the significance of the development, may governments have adopted policies that encourage both inflow and outflow of students. The policy of the government has not been clearly stated. The need to be clarified and uh, the universities informed of the action to be taken as regard inflow of international students. Why internationalize? Uh, number one, internationalization with programs of academic cooperation and significant number of international students is an important criterion in all major world ranking systems. The failure of Indian universities to make it uh, to the top of 200 is partly due to the ins uh, insignificant exit of internationalization. Number two, India, Indian youth need to be exposed to the global culture if they are to become global citizens. Uh, this can be achieved by meeting more international students either abroad or at home campuses. Number three, international students will bring national diversity to our university campuses. Uh, over the years, the international students will enhance the visibility to India. Opening the education system for global research using more international students could lead to greater international collaborations, uh, better publication records, and greater visibility among the peers who rank the universities. More international students in India would bring in additional revenue to the country through tuition fees and living expenses. What needs to be done? The government should adopt a clear definition for international students. Study the various reports of UGC and AIU on the promotion of internationalization and decide on their implement, uh, implementation. Uh, state uh, in clear terms its policy and inform universities accordingly. Make special provisions for internationalization and identify universities for the allotment. 
promote other pathways for internationalization like academic partnership for teaching and learning promotion international collaboration in promote international collaboration in research and encourage inter institutional research in india the vigorous promotion of international student mobility is a necessity Uh, the lukewarm attitude of public indian higher education institutions and the government towards promotion of international students inflow can only be regretted and india has the largest third india has world's third largest education system with more than 800 universities uh, over 39000 colleges and more than 23 million students Uh, if india is to ke uh, keep pace with the rest of the world internationalization of education especially international student mobility into india academic partnership and research collaboration has to be encouraged and promoted all stakeholders must take positive action in this regard thank you thank you dr bahir my main take away from this presentation is that we need to applaud the vision of dr majumdar all those years ago you thought of bringing foreign students together into our country and you have played a lead role in this regard in our country so thank you very much uh, as our last speaker on the panel we have dr dilip padgaonkar he is well known to all of you he is a great public intellectual in our country his views are heard with deep respect on various issues of national affairs and global affairs while deeply anchored in pune he has straddled the world as a journalist and as an international civil servant with the unesco i am privileged to know him for 48 years during which period he has been my mentor guide and friend dilip I'll try and speak as softly as I can, because I see a lot of people are taking a quiet nap, <laughs> and I wouldn't want to disturb them. But then, to others who are awake, let me get back my voice. Over the past two days, you've heard various people speak about hard power, about soft power, soft power relations between the subcontinent and West Asia, etc., etc. I'm going to speak about soft power. but by and large i'm going to concentrate on something that is dear to almost all of us i'm going to speak about the jalebi who doesn't know the jalebi why the jalebi because when i was a student in paris each time i went to a north african restaurant moroccan algerian tunisian when they served the dessert they served the jalebi and i got to know that the jalebi which they pronounced as jalebia tasted somewhat differently from our jalebi because the batter that was used was different they used a lot of honey they used a lot of rose water but that set me thinking about how the jalebi eaten by the arabs of north africa came down to us and over the years my study yielded some very fascinating insights about one aspect of soft power namely gastronomy or cuisine or food how the intermingling of gastronomic or culinary cultures has been part and parcel of soft power so i did what at that time there was no google guru but i did manage to get hold of certain encyclopedias to find out whether i could learn more about the provenance of the jalebi and here briefly is what i found i found that there is a very famous dictionary of indian expressions that dictionary is called hobson jobson it was first published Uh, in the in 19th century 
1886, and it mentions the Jalebi under the entry Jalaubi. And Jalaubi, which it says, is apparently a corruption of the, Arab, the Arabic Zalabia or the Persian Zilabia. But then there were no other details in the Hobson Jobson, no clues about how one could travel backwards, so to speak, to get to the source of Jalebi. But my hopes soared a little bit when I learned from the Oxford Companion to Food that Jalebi is known in Iran as Zulabia or Zulubia, and that it is prepared on special occasions and distributed to the poor during the month of Ramzan. In Lebanon, I also learned there is a pastry called Zellabia, but it's shaped like a finger rather than like a swirl. You also have versions of the Jalebi in Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus, though under different names. The Oxford Companion suggests that the original recipe of this confectionery is listed in al-Baghdadi's famous cookery book published in the 13th century. So it would seem to me that the Jalebi has been around at least since the 13th century. Or that is what I assumed. I was wrong. Because later works show that the Zalebia originated in West Asia. It in fact originated according to the latest data available in a place not far from Marrakesh in Morocco, traveled all of Morocco into Algeria, into Tunisia, from Tunisia into Turkey, into Iran, down to Afghanistan, into the plains of the Punjab, and then once they reached across the Indus, they then branch out into various branches in India, and therefore the making of the Jalebi keeps on changing. So I hunted a little bit more and found out that a very famous Indologist who worked as a curator for more than 30 years in the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute here in Pune, a great thinker by the name of P.K. Gode, had published in 1943 an entire article research-based on the origins and the itinerary of the Jalebi. And this in substance is what he said, and which set me thinking about soft power. Soft power is a recent nomenclature. But soft power has been on for centuries. There being exchange of goods, exchange of services, exchange of ideas, and I'll come to that in a minute. But the Jalebi business fascinated me because the itinerary doesn't stop anywhere. So I learned from this research paper done by Dr. Gode that the first reference to the Jalebi is contained in a Jain work. The Jain work is written by a thinker by the name of Jina Sura, and it was apparently composed in AD 1450. So, matlab ye hai ke at least for 500 years we have been feasting on jalebis. I mean, that has been established. This work was subsequently cited in cookery books published in later centuries, including the 17th century classic, and it is a classic, Bhojan Kutuhala by Raghunatha. I don't think there will be a reprint of Bhojan Kutuhala because it contains two recipes of a meat that has recently been banned. I won't even mention the name of the meat. <laughs> in India, in India, as in West Asia, as I said, Jalebi is known by various names. And the names themselves sound very, very fine. They're lovely names, a nice lilt to each name. Jalebi. Jalebi, Jalapi, Zalapi, Jalapir, 
Imrati, Jahangiri, and so forth. And the ingredients, too, vary from region to region. In some parts of India, the batter consists of odad dal and rice with a little basin and wheat flour. In some others, it consists of semolina and baking powder. In Bengal, it contains khoya, etc. Then the ways of eating jalebi again differ even today from country to country. In Afghanistan, a classic breakfast consists of fish curry and jalebi, not together, separately. <laughs> so, what does this history of the jalebi tell you? Today, India exports jalebi to the rest of the world. So something which came to us from Marrakesh in Morocco, traveled over several centuries down to the southernmost tip of India, variations of the sweetmeat to be found in every state of the country. Today, this very so-called sweetmeat or delicacy or delicatessen is being exported to countries outside. Where in the world can you find a better example of soft power? Because anything that enchants the palate contains ingredients and influences drawn from many sources. So, the reason why I have spoken about Jalebi is to drive home a single point. And I shall reiterate that once and towards the end of my speech. What does it tell you? It tells you that the Jalebi's popularity is a salutary reminder that food and language, arts and ideas, values and lifestyles are all products of a give and take between the peoples of the world. By that token, we must be wary, we must be careful of attempts to define culture in terms of purity, roots, mainstream, majoritarian, essence, core, indigenous, and so forth. Because such notions breed bigotry, not creativity. And at the heart of the exchanges, as far as soft power is concerned, is creativity, is intermingling, is, ladies and gentlemen, symbiosis. And I say this because India has been singularly lucky in being exposed to the outside world. We've heard in the past two days references to that. For at least four and a half thousand years, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans have been coming to the shores of India, moving on around Southeast Asia to go to China, and then going back. They came with a certain number of goods, they went back with a certain number of goods. But the meeting point, as we just heard from Ambassador Srinivasan, the meeting point where all this flourished was the Malabar coast. If there is one part of the country, in fact, the one part of the entire subcontinent, which became a symbol of globalization in the history of the world, I would say it is present-day Kerala. Because it's in present-day Kerala that traders came from the shores of Europe. They came across the Red Sea. They came from the African coast. They obviously came from the Gulf. And these traders came laden with a certain number of things that the Indian market deliberately sought. What are the things that were brought into India, largely? Tin, lead, coral glasses, gold, silver coins, and wine. The finest Italian wines were brought here, and there are lots of very lovely rest, uh, stories about how um, dearly uh, the Indian elites at that time loved those Italian wines. And what is it that we exported from India? What we exported were, of course, spices. To begin with, pepper and ginger. In fact, not too many people know that for at least two, two and a half centuries, the most expensive thing 
that you could buy in Rome was a seed of pepper. So the Indians gave pepper and then ginger, and in lieu of pepper, they got gold and silver coins. The result is that the Roman elite at that time emptied the treasury because they used pepper and they used ginger in just about everything, in their stews, in their food, in their wines, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, the economy went fat. In the meantime, the Malabaris had enriched themselves with the gold and silver coins. But Malabar was also the place which had the largest cos concentration of a cosmopolitan population. They were people from absolutely all parts of, of Europe and from the Middle East who made the Malabar coast their home. And this matter speeded up. I'm going to not bore you with dates and so on, but this toing and froing between the, the Gulf area and India became very frequent because there was a Greek traveler aided by an Arab assistant navigator who discovered that if you sailed during the summers from the Gulf to India, you could sail much faster. And if you could sail back in winter, because the winds were blowing in the other direction, you could go faster. And therefore, you saved on the amount of time you spent to cover the same logical miles. And the speedier communication also meant more trade. So if, for example, some 20 ships left, let's say, Egypt every year to come to India, once these wind courses were discovered, they were up to more than 700 in a year's time. And do you know what the phenomenon was called? The phenomenon was called monsoon. And the word monsoon is derived from an Arabic word, mausim, which means the weather. So ladies and gentlemen, give and take, intermingle, is something that's been happening to all cultures. And as far as Kerala is concerned, as someone very brilliantly put it, they not only came with their tins and their coral glasses and the um, silver coins and the gold time, they also settled down, many of them settled down in, um, uh, on the Malabar coast. And when they settled down, they also got married to the local population. And as one writer put it, and I'm going to quote just one sentence for that, before Vasco da Gama, he says, landed in Calicut in 1498. The progeny of these people were known as the Mapila. They had come to mean exclusively Muslim traders, descendants of Arab and Persian traders who had been coming to India from the ninth century. And the writer says, clearly, traders had not only exchanged goods across oceans, but enriched the host country's gene pool. So this, I think, are part and parcel of what I like to call the phenomenon of globalization. We need to know more about it because commerce is wonderful. To speak about financial transactions is great. To speak about armaments, making of industry, that is fine. What it seems to me is lacking in all this is just that little bit of romance that's required to speak about the give and take between cultures and civilizations. And therefore, the very first soft power that I would like to develop, hopefully here in Symbiosis, is for our young in India and for the young in West Asia to be more conscious, more aware of how there was this give and take between these two parts of the world, how they enriched each other. Some of it is known, many of you know, and we study that in school. We no need to know the details. When, for example, did the Persians start translating the Upanishads? When was the first time that the Ramayana and the Mahabharata was translated straight from the Sanskrit into Persian? 
when, for example, did certain Arabic and Persian texts be translated into Sanskrit and Pali? We know that. We know that means those who take an interest to. But that's something which is extraordinarily interesting to, to come along. And then what did we get, which has proved to be durable in terms of soft power exchanges? They could have been no architecture worth its name in this country without the influence of Persia. Persian influences in music, in miniature painting, in literature, in food. Before the arrival of the Persian culture, no one in India even knew remotely what pilaf meant or what kebab meant. That came from Persia. Architecture, the splendors of Indian architecture owe much to the Persian tradition. And I'll end up by saying that my own mother tongue, Marathi, consists, according to a French philologist who wrote a thesis on the subject 105 years ago, 25% of the vocabulary in Marathi consists of pure Persian words. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is what I mean by soft power. Soft power is not something that merely entertains you. Soft power is something that moves you, that makes you think, that makes you feel better, that exposes your mind to the outside world. Soft power is when you can listen to Ghulam Ali without some goons threatening to close down the concert. Thank you very much. Let me share with you one story about Dilip's role in promoting culture through encounters with various different people. When he was with UNESCO, he went to West Africa. And as you know, when they are with the exuberance of their hospitality, they have this huge platter full of rice and meat. And as he started, and it is shared by all the people who sit around the same platter. So as Dilip started assaulting a piece of meat, he found that it showed resistance and then found it was actually the finger of the person in front of him, which he was seeking to grab. Hard power. Uh, we, you know, when we refer to the connectivities, these are not just emotional recalls or nostalgia. It has been the living experience of our region around the Indian Ocean for several millennia. And therefore, what has been created across India, Iran, and the Arabian Peninsula is a civilizational space that we share and that we have, we have enriched each other because of these encounters that have been the lived experience. It has affected our food, our clothing, our language, the way we think, a broad ethos has emerged from these interactions. And you know, when we had exchanges in terms of commerce, when boats used to go across, the boat was constructed by Malabar teak and rope and, and the coir. The sailors used to be Omani and Indian, and the goods traded were from all across this region, which is today referred to as the Silk Road and the Spice Road. And these extraordinary connectivities are with us right to this day. The challenges to, to civilizational space come from those who seek to have exclusive mobilizations for short-term political advantage, which challenge these broad identities in favor of something narrower, which they call fault lines. Uh, we have a few minutes, and if, if you have some questions to put to the panel, to the distinguished panel, please do so. Ask questions or share an observation with us. We will have about 10 minutes and then we'll call a halt. Thank you. Students particularly. Uh, yes. Good evening, sir. My name is Anisha. I'm from the College of Nursing. Uh, when you said Gulf, India also is a huge supplier of nurses to the Gulf. So uh, I, would, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Dino that um, from, since you are from the education system of the Gulf, or you are a part of it, 
when Gulf requires so many nurses from India for their skill, why doesn't Gulf think of exchanging students from the nursing colleges of India and the nursing colleges of Gulf? Why can't Gulf think of an exchange program? It's, it's a fabulous idea. I think the only reason is because the, the nursing provision within, again, within the region is, is pretty inadequate. Uh, and I think that's certainly been the trend. So what you're starting to see, and as I alluded to when I spoke, what you're starting to see is an emphasis from governments within the region towards improving their education system with a clear focus on higher ed and vocational. So you're starting to see this in Saudi Arabia specifically. Uh, I think countries like the UAE and Qatar have the benefit of being smaller. Their natural populations are smaller. So they can, frankly, still afford to import that talent. Uh, Saudi Arabia, given the, the size and scale of the country and, and some of the endemic issues that it faces, has realized that it needs to do more. So uh, it's, a, it's an absolutely valid idea. I think there's a period of maturity that still needs to come into the space. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tanushri. I'm from Simbaisu School for Liberal Arts. Um, education for me has always been a process that should be independent of, say, any kind of underlying motive, whether it be politics or something else. Um, I agree that this is a highly idealistic and impractical notion, but I would still like to put forward the question. Um, do you feel that the idea of using education as soft power could, and especially for the purpose of strengthening diplomatic ties, could that put the students who are receiving it at the risk of subscribing to, subconsciously subscribing to a certain kind of economic and political ideology without questioning it because that's all they have been exposed to. And also, um, how would, what are your suggestions for mitigating this risk? Yeah, so if I could have your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, you seem to be presuming that there could be evil influence of education on politics and commerce or other way around, vice versa. Well, this is, a, this is an interesting thought, but what really happens is that we presume that there are mutual interests between our two countries or two regions, and uh, those interests are complementary, and that is why we think that cultural ties will promote political and economic ties. But if you feel that it is making the education or the students victim of some prejudices, then I think it's something worth, worth thinking about. But my own feeling is that it doesn't operate that way, at, at least as far as I have seen, because the complementarities are clear and what the two sides are seeking is more or less the same thing. And if your education and the education of the students in fact promote such linkages, what is wrong with it? Just one sentence. You know, the big, your question is absolutely, uh, in my view, an accurate one. Uh, and the best way to define it is, so long as education teaches you not what to think, but how to think, this danger will not be there. Because in my view, the purpose of education is to be able to ask questions. And once you start asking questions, then the kind of pressures that you have in mind, whether these are political or ideological or commercial, they don't operate. So the, the questioning mind, the interrogation that comes forth from within, this is far more important than rote learning or what happen, what's happening today, because you are not taught how to think, you are taught, told what you ought to think, just as you're being told more and more what you ought to wear or not to wear what you ought to eat or not to eat, et cetera, et cetera. So the questioning mind is, a, the, is the driving force behind education. And once you keep that in mind, then the dangers or the risks that you've spelled out, those would probably be minimized. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Rhythm, and I'm from Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. My question is to Mr. Dino. 
so for major part of your speech, you focused on how India can contribute to the education in UAE. But much scope lies in the edu education sector in India. I just want to find out if the Varki group is taking any significant steps to improve and contribute to the education sector in India as well? Yeah, actually, of, of the 250,000 students that we currently educate, I would argue that 100 to 110,000 currently are within India through various platforms that we own. And within our broader network, I would even argue that there are 140,000 students out of the 250,000 that are Indian by birth. So certainly, I would hope that given that context, it is something that we still actively support. Good afternoon. Uh, my, na my name is Philip John. I'm a student of the Symbiosis International Business Program. Uh, my question to the panel is, uh, in this current scenario, from the perspective of current scenario, how important is the role of a media partnership in building soft ties between countries? Media partnership. Yeah. I think in the entertainment area, media partnerships are certainly possible. And when I say entertainment, I include, of course, sports. But in terms of tying up with news channels, uh, which carry both political and economic news, I would be extremely uh, careful, primarily because, you know, the uh, media operates under very different conditions in different countries. And therefore, unless you have a kind of a level playing field where the basic values of the media are, are shared, then collaboration is very difficult. Uh, I don't see, for example, an Indian television uh, satellite uh, tying up with, uh, uh, let us say, the, the Chinese national network. That can't happen. I would be extremely worried also if an Indian television channel were to tie up with a powerful American channel. Because th these are different, uh, you know, different uh, uh, ways of functioning. But uh, there are, in limited areas, there are possibilities. I think, for example, Indian media ought to be working much more closely with the media, say, in, um, uh, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, our neighboring countries. And it so happens that there are virtually no Indian correspondents stationed in the capitals of these countries, just as there are very few correspondents from these countries stationed in Delhi. So these are areas where I think some degree of collaboration can work. But restrictions on the media vary from country to country. And therefore, I think any kind of fruitful uh, collaboration is out. And of course, there is the larger imperative, which is that uh, uh, any such enterprise needs to make money. And uh, if that is not built in into that system of collaboration, then it won't take off. But as I said, it's entirely possible to do so in sports and up to a very large limit also in, in entertainment, not otherwise. Hello, sir. My name is Nazrul Hussain. I am from Symbiosis Institute of International Business. As it is said that the way to the heart of a person is through his stomach. So how can the food processing sector in India can be built on this? I think that's already happening, but... Well, listen, um, about three years ago, the government of India had called some of us um, to ask the very question that you've just asked. And we did submit a report, I mean, I was in charge of that report, saying that in the campaign called Incredible India, we have put across, you know, all our tourist sites and um, various things, uh, then came in yoga and music and so on. But the one thing that we did not highlight was the extreme diversity of Indian cuisines. And I know a little bit about this because I take a lot of interest in the history of food. Uh, according to one study, every 25 kilometers, the way to make Arar Dal changes. And which is fantastic. The, the French have 226 kinds of cheeses. And I told the French once that we have 20,000 ways of making dals. So let's see who civilization triumphs. But I think there is a, a, now there is a systematic effort to market Indian food, right from street food to fine dining in ways which didn't happen even five years ago. But this is not 
thanks to the courtesy of the government of India, it is thanks to a lot of private people, particularly young chefs. I mean, I've seen chefs now in their late 20s and early 30s who are doing precisely that, who are putting on the international market Indian food and taking into account, I mean, some have ventured into areas, risky areas, but where they've been successful into fusion food. So um, I wouldn't trust the government to do any such thing because the government is always five years behind what people want and people do. But these young, young people, they've been doing it in a very big way. Where I think we need to uh, make a lot of effort really is at the beginning of the supply chain. Because 40% of the food that we produce is lost in transit. It's either purloined on the way or it rots because it, we don't have enough silos to protect them. But once, and this is particularly true of farmers who grow vegetables and fruit. So I think once that is done, and once you get more and more younger people taking an interest in, in food, then you could witness an absolute revolution. I mean, you will, in, you will absolutely surprise the world with the sheer range and diversity of, uh, of Indian food. Let me end by giving you one instance of how these things work. When the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, came to India, he started uh, his uh, trip in Gujarat. And uh, one reporter asked a member of the entourage of the Chinese president what he thought about the food that was served, and it was Gujarati food. So the young Chinese diplomat, very diplomatic, said, oh, it was absolutely wonderful, but why were they serving desserts all the time? I think we should, uh, thank you. We will pause at this point. Luckily for all of you, Dilip is captive, is your captive here in Pune. Uh, this, in this panel has celebrated India's cultural diversity, its historical connectivities, and its extraordinary influence over the centuries across its neighborhood and the influence that it has itself experienced so that a unique cultural space has evolved in our neighborhood. We are seeking to get back to that space and to once again give it a rejuvenation, a resurgence, which had been interrupted by the short experience of colonialism. We, are, we have embarked on that adventure. Thank you. Um, I request Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed to kindly felicitate Mr. Dino Varke. <laughs> Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan. <laughs> Dr. Veena Bhalla. and Dr. Dilip Padgaonkar. Uh, I, request, I request Dr. Vidya Erodeko to kindly felicitate Ambassador Talmi Zahmat. As we draw towards the end of the conference, it would be critical for us to look, look back on the deliberations of the past two days. Uh, I now invite Ambassador Sudhir Devre to give the concluding remarks to the conference. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, as we are now drawing close to the conference of two days, very intensive discussions, debate, observations on a subject 
which was chosen to be link west India and the Gulf. An area which is our neighborhood, and as we all heard this afternoon, which enjoys civilizational space with India for thousands of years, with a variety of commonalities, and yet a region which we seem to have neglected, a region with which we seem to be knowing so little. And therefore, the topicality of this conference, the timing of selecting this subject, in many ways was seen to be very opportune. And I'm happy that the last two days saw very open, very candid, and very passionate discussions on a range of issues relating to the Gulf. Honorable Vice President of India, in his speech, a very well thought out and a scholarly discourse that he gave, he um, again reiterated the importance of this region and said that the peace and stability of this region is absolutely vital to India and India has very high stakes in this regard. He also called for strengthening bilateral relationships with each country. And I think in his final remarks, he said, with its enhanced cap capacity, India could be looking for inclusive security arrangements with this region. I think these remarks are very significant coming as they do from Honorable Vice President. Our discussions covered the whole gamut, the regional security issues, the question of energy, which is so important between India and this Gulf, trade and investment, relations with two large countries of the region, namely Iran and Iraq, and finally, education and culture. We were also fortunate to have the Honorable Minister for Petroleum and Natural Gas to address us, who, who also spoke about the importance of the energy security. And um, we were assured by a number of speakers, especially from the Gulf, that energy supplies to India will continue uninterruptedly in the future. The address of the Oman minister was particularly significant in which he talked about a number of projects a country like Oman has been engaged in India, particularly in context of the energy security. Uh, Gulf is also undergoing a lot of diversification, even in the area of energy. Though they are so rich in hydrocarbons, they're also working on renewable energy. They are conscious of the need for various reforms, various changes which are required with respect to climate change. I think there is a lot which we can learn from each other. There are best practices in the Gulf which we need to adopt. And I think that is one takeaway I would like to take, uh, I would take myself from the conference that we often seem to completely forget that the Gulf countries which have been exposed to international competition, global presence, global competition uh, in their infrastructure, in their development, and we cannot just get away with what was said at Jugad or uh, 1920 kind of approach, which India cannot afford uh, even back, back, back home. With respect to trade and investment, in the last 10 years, there has been significant increase in India Gulf trade. And I recall when I was in the ministry, uh, this region was of course important, especially in the context of energy requirements, but our trade was really minimal. And today the trade has now risen to $160 billion. The trade is being diversified, the economies are being diversified in the Gulf countries. They are going through, of course, very difficult time now, 
uh, with the falling um, oil prices. Those are, of course, problems for them. In some ways, there are also opportunities for us. So the discussion on the trade and investment, which took place earlier in the day, I think it was very important. India has capabilities. India has opportunities. And I think if we can put our own house together, we can really benefit a great deal. In fact, sky is the limit for our trade opportunities in this region. As far as investment is concerned, one figure stuck in my mind that was only $3.6 billion. And of course, Talmiz mentioned later on to me that there has been equity of $30 billion. But considering the fact that these countries had huge surplus funds earlier, not now, I think we could have got much more investment from these countries. In fact, Indian investment in these countries is much larger than the investment from these countries. So I think something more proactive needs to be done with respect to seeking investment from Gulf countries into India, especially in the sector of, uh, sector of infrastructure and so on. In the discussion on regional security issue, which was the first session, one very important question came in the context of the present situation in the whole West Asia region. As we all heard, violent um, conflicts are going on in this region. There has been rampant terrorism. There has also been civil war. And today in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Libya, things have been very uncertain and there's been uh, bloodshed and conflict. What happens in this region, which is not very far away from India, will certainly have implications on India too. And they can manifest in a variety of ways. India, which has such huge stakes in this region, has to do something and that was a refrain that was a strong point made by a number of um, both the panelists as well as from the audience also. Can we really sit idle or can we have ways and means of somehow contributing to the security of this region? It is also that we also see that some of these countries are seeking uh, India's assistance, India's direct help in addressing their security concerns. A very interesting proposal was made at the conference that uh, India should adopt a proactive role and come up with a kind of a idea of a forum or kind of a uh, ARF, like the ASEAN Regional Forum kind of a suggestion where countries of this region can come to a table, dialogue table, and India can facilitate that. India can uh, call upon other major powers of the world, which have also high stakes in the region, to come to a dialogue with the countries of the Gulf with a view to finding peace and security of this region. I think it's a very valuable idea. Of course, uh, there are uh, se several pitfalls in this, and this needs to be really considered at length. The discussion on Iran and Iraq was very important. When we were uh, setting the agenda for this conference, we were really wondering whether we should have that. And then we felt that unless we address the issues of Iran and Iraq at this conference, I think the whole subject will be incomplete. And Iran, Iraq came for a very interesting discussion this morning. The, Observation by the ambassador of Iran when he said that Iran would be interested in membership of SARC, I think it was very interesting. Uh, I hadn't heard this kind of uh, observation in the past. He also mentioned that the Iran, uh, Pakistan, India pipeline project is still on the table. He also mentioned that Iran had made offers of something like $8 billion of projects to India recently, and they were awaiting 
response from India. All that shows there are enormous possibilities of developing closer cooperation with Iran, which as you know is a country of 80 million population. It's an emerging regional power and post lifting of sanctions uh, from Iran, I can visualize enormous opportunities for developing closer cooperation between Iran and India, the two countries which have enjoyed ties and contacts for millennia. We also had the presentation by His Excellency Ambassador Berwari, who was very kind to come to Pune for this conference, despite the fact he had to travel whole night from uh, Nepal, and he is about to leave India on transfer. And when he said that uh, India could play a role of a mediator in the conflicts which are raging in, in West Asia, again, showing the kind of respect and importance that India is now attached by our friends in the Gulf. I think in this kind of situation, there is a widespread concern among all, all countries of the Gulf that should this situation continue, it could really be very harmful, not only for them, but for the interests of the countries around with which their interests are inextricably linked. And therefore, I think a suggestion like this also needs to be studied. He also hinted at India's uh, uh, rightful claim towards permanent membership of the Security Council. So there are several things which have been expressed during this conference which we need to keep in mind and uh, take them forward. Of course, the last session on the uh, issue of uh, culture and uh, education couldn't have been more interesting. Well, when we talk of soft power, this formulation which is relatively new, again it has, as was pointed out, an adjunct of power. And this whole discussion of soft power comes in the context of the differences which really arise mainly from power projections of countries. As we discussed a few hundred years ago in the civilizational space, as Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad mentioned, there was no such conflict. In that sense, pre-Westphalian order, you know, Westphalia 1648 is regarded as the date for the beginning of the nation state concept. And pre-Westphalia, there were no clear nation bound, national boundaries, there were no concept of nations as such. They were, of course, cultures and entities. So, soft power actually was the basis of contact at that time. And this four or five hundred years of interruption, which has been caused by the emergence of this nation state system, is today driving us again to come back to that soft power. So in a way, soft power existed in the past. We are again seeking to bring, down, bring again to us a new form of soft power. Disregarding this la, la, long, long interregnum which has existed. But let us be real, we are living in a real world where nation states exist and these conflicts will also remain. So soft power will have to be well balanced with the hard power. Soft power will, uh, should be used to promote uh, better relations among countries. And I think nothing could be uh, more suitable uh, than the kind of uh, soft power which has existed between uh, countries of the Gulf and India, be it in the form of uh, tradition, monsoon, uh, dress, um, the, tr the tradition of trading between Arabs and India, uh, or the food and so on. As I said, we have had a very rich fare of ideas, observations and recommendations. A conference of this kind, I think it needs to be fully used as an input uh, for the policy makers, whether they will take all our suggestions fully seriously or not, one doesn't know. But uh, what is now going to be done 
we will attempt to have various thoughts and ideas put together. And I recall just now a suggestion made by the young lady about um, uh, exchanges in the field of nursing. I mean, such ideas are also need to be taken into account when we go with the report uh, to, the, to the government and uh, also to other various uh, government as well as private institutions as to how relations between the Gulf and India can be further uh, strengthened and enhanced. To that end, this conference, I hope, uh, um, proved to be a very useful exercise. And I would like to thank Dr. Mujumdar, and Dr. Yerodekar, Dr. Rajni Gupte for having taken the initiative and uh, arranged this very extensive exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We request all the students to remain seated until the dignitaries leave the auditorium.